All right. Hi, I'm Dave Stewart. Welcome to the Octo Project Developer Day. We're very excited to have you here. Um, this is, uh, we're trying a little bit different format than we've done on some of the previous developer days. We think this, hopefully, this will be helpful for you to really um, advance what you're doing with the Octo Project and, um, and also, you know, as you see things that maybe you could see improved. We'd love to encourage everybody to, to work together to make this a, a phenomenal project. So I'm delighted to have you all here. I'm David Stewart. I usually live um, up in Oregon. Uh, Tracy Irway is also here. She usually also lives in Oregon. She's been in the back of the room. Um, she's gonna, I'm going to start out with a quick introduction for um, the developer day, and then uh, she's going to give also a little uh, piece about some of the other advocacy work that we're doing. So uh, without further ado, uh, I actually got to confess I didn't do these slides because I ran out of time. And I'm really, really grateful to Jeff um, Osier Mixon for doing the slides because I like ran, totally ran out of time. Um, so we're actually, so the way the day is going to be um, structured here is we're going to do a brief introduction. That's me. Um, then we're going to have several technical presentations on important topics that I think will, um, you know, hopefully really help you out. And then we've structured things um, here so that we've got an hour where we've, we've dedicated so you could have one-on-one -on -one or small group discussions on particular topics. So we've actually going to set things up so that you can actually connect with experts kind of directly. And so uh, we're, we're, you know, treating this as seeing how this will work. Hopefully it will really give you good you know, answer your questions immediately and get some, you know, really good one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction going. So that's sort of the goal. And then, you know, drinks and, and food and that sort of thing afterwards. Um, so uh, this is, uh, let, me, let me kind of talk to uh, um, the technical talks in red. So um, uh, first we're going to start out with a, a topic of uh, working with the kernel, which Tom Zanussi is going to be uh, presenting. Um, and. Uh, you know, there's, there's some things you need to, you know, kind of be aware of working with the kernel tool, so I think this is uh, going to be very good. Um, then we have this sort of uh, uh, trifecta here with uh, Kuhn, Kamaraj, and Beth Flanagan talking about workflow. One of the things that when you have a, a fairly, we have a fairly powerful set of tools, I think, in the Octo Project, but we haven't, you know, defined a very specific workflow, like do this, do this, do this, right? And so, um, one of the things that um, we, but we understand people kind of come to the project and they go, well, help me out a little bit. Give me a little bit of a, a clue as to how to uh, hook together the Tinker Toys so that I actually have something that makes sense. Or I may change it, but just give me kind of that, that general idea. So I think what these guys are, are going to be focusing on is, is um, with, within their expertise on workflow, which they have considerable expertise, um, uh, uh, I think they'll be able to help a lot with that. Um, after a break, Kem Raj is going to be talking about advanced customization. Kem, uh, I don't know if this is the same version of the talk you gave in Barcelona, but that was an awesome talk. I thought it was incredible. So this, this will uh, be, not, not that any of the rest of them will be uh, bad, but I really, I, I thought it was an excellent talk. It was really good. And then Jessica will be here um, to talk specifically about our, our using Eclipse. Um, uh, we, we've Try to you know include that as a as a part of the developer experience. It's not a required part. Um, people are are very happy uh, developing without Eclipse, but you know the Eclipse support I think has been a very powerful part of the developer experience, and we're trying to extend it as well, which I'll I'll talk about a little bit in my intro. Um, right then, five to six is where we have this really this green zone here is the one to one, and we're going to set this thing up. I don't know exactly who's going to do it, but I understand there's going to be. Um, different tables designated for the different uh, topics. And then we'll do uh, at six, wrap up, refreshment, social gathering, et cetera. Anything else we should cover that we're not? Uh, I always like to ask. I don't know that anyone will actually say it. All right, I'm going to talk about, give you a quick introduction to the Octo Project in 15 minutes. <coughs> and it really is um, an umbrella project. Actually, uh, Kuhn and I were talking at lunch a little bit about kind of how the Octo Project is a uh, uh, an umbrella uh, project, including a number of other open source projects. And so, um, how many have already heard my introduction about the Octo project? Only a few in the back of there? Oh, awesome. Okay, so those of you who already heard it, please bear with me. I'm gonna, it's a shortened version. Um, for those of you who haven't, I'll do my best to answer any questions you might have and not be too confusing. Um, but it really is uh, both a, a collaboration space for many projects, as we've talked about. Um, the, main, the, the three main things I talk about with the Octo Project is it's a build system, it's content, and it's a developer experience. 
So uh, we'll talk, we'll zoom into, you know, each of these in a second. But it really, uh, you know, allows, uh, it, you know, e each of these in some extent can be thought of somewhat independently. Um, we support all of the main architectures for uh, embedded, uh, ARM, PowerPC, MIPS, and x86. Um, for several of these, we have different 32 and 64-bit variants as well. Um, even for x86, we have the x x32 um, ABI, which is a way to use the 64-bit version of the registers without having 32-bit or 64-bit addresses and immediate, so that you actually have a much smaller footprint, but you get all those registers to schedule against. <coughs> it's also a, a collaboration space. I apologize if I cough a lot. I apologize for that. I just kind of came down with something a few days ago, so I'll do my best to not hack too much. I think I may grab some water, though, first before I do that too much. Um, thanks. Uh, I graduated from the Sippy Cups uh, many years ago, uh, but, but thank you for the... It would be nice to have a bottle, but I, I don't. <coughs> um, and, you know, and uh, uh, part of the, the, this is, is a common place to find board support packages. Now, people could put BSPs um, really anywhere associated with, with the projects they're doing, but we sort of have a, wanted to have a common place where people could find them as well. Um, we, one of the cool things about the project is actually standardize what a BSP for a Linux OS should look like. In fact, I was just talking to somebody last week, and they said even for other OSs that they're trying to get working on hardware, they often look at our BSPs as a reference. <coughs> is there how to pull all the things together? And <coughs> oh, boy. And then we have the, the Eclipse plugins. Saul was having dinner next to you last night. I think that's what did it to me. I think you were, you were kind of... Um, so, you know, really, the, why use something like the Yocto project? Because many people uh, have done embedded Linux. Uh, maybe they use something like a, a desktop distro, like a Fedora or Ubuntu or something like that. Or maybe they might um, use Android. Or a lot of people have been, because there, have been, there hasn't been anything that we've kind of been able to all collaborate around before, there are all kinds of little systems that are out there for building embedded Linux. So the, the hopeful idea here was to actually have you know, uh, something that would solve a big problem that was, um, well, you can hack something together, but what can you do if, if what do you do if you want to take it on to the next project, right? This is something which, uh, um, you know, you, you know with, with, with any of these operating systems, well, I can hack out the things I don't need. Um, well, I, maybe I don't need a desktop, but I do need this and I don't need that. All right, I got it hacked up, going. But then it's like, okay, new version of the, the underlying OS comes out. Well, now, do I have to redo everything again? So as engineers, I sort of feel like we've kind of taken an engineering approach to this, which is um, have something that minimizes the amount of rework you have to do when there's a new hardware board that comes in or a new release of upstream projects or any of these advances. You don't have to completely redo everything when you go on to the next thing. So we really designed this for you doing, ha establishing a long-term, you know, hopefully profitable business doing embedded devices. And so that's kind of the idea behind this. Um, so these are some of the things, you know, you can always hack stuff together, but, you know, if you want to turn on, you know, debugging for random sources, uh, maybe, you know, like I said, upgrade to newer versions of things. Uh, maybe you want to build something with real-time enabled or, you know, switch to something else, different um, tool chain, uh, different hardware. How much of stuff do you have to completely redo? Um, this is one of the things, providing a source offer with, with GPL, particularly GPL licensed source, right? You need to provide, at, by the terms of the GPL, when you have a Linux-based device, you need to provide all the sources that went into, all the GPL licensed sources that went into making up the OS. You need to provide that source offer. Well, if you base what you're doing on, you know, Fedora, trying to find all the source RPMs that made up what you just built, and then, you know, making sure you have that someplace and, you know, what, what we do in the Octo project is um, through very simple automated uh, mechanism that we out outline very clearly how to create your source archive and a source license manifest. So we can produce those things that you can then, you know, put in a, a place to satisfy the source offer, and it's, it's, um, it, it's really designed for doing uh, that sort of thing. You know, filtering out license versions. Some people have kind of a, we like the GPL. We think the GPL is great. Some people don't like GPL v3. I was talking to Tim Bird. Uh, he says he stopped being uh, diplomatic. He just doesn't like GPL v3. I, you know, we're uh, fine with it either way, but if you want to filter out all the GPL v3 sources, we have a single line you can add to a configuration file. 
or a little checkbox you can check in the, in the build tool and eliminate all the GPL v3 code. So that's an advantage in uh, certain instances. And then, you know, if you want to move to a commercially supported OS, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of us might be in the situation where we can create a proof of concept, but then it's like, well, I need to get commercial support for this thing. If I base it on Fedora, you know, I'm not sure Red Hat's going to give you the time of day for supporting an embedded device, right, on, based on Fedora or Red Hat. Um, right, if, it, if you base it on Android, um, maybe, I mean, I don't know, getting commercial support for that thing might be tough. The great thing about the Octo project is we got commercial support from Wind River, Mentor, uh, Mentor Graphics, uh, Montavista, Enea, and, uh, and, and other, a, a larger ecosystem. So you can get commercial support for, for what you're doing. Okay, so um, who is the Octo project? It's silicon providers. Um, it's, uh, you know, OSVs, embedded OSVs. It's um, uh, people who are making devices. Uh, and it's also just people in the community, the open embedded, open source community, uh, working with us to, to really make, you know, really get everything together to make embedded Linux great. All right, so uh, one of the exciting things is we're at a point in history where we're actually all able to collaborate together um, to make, to, and, and, you know, we took the best build system uh, we started really working with that and started really honing the, the content, the developer tools, um, gaining, you know, you know, cooperation. And that's been very exciting to see. I think we finally see everyone, you know, focusing on this. Uh, and then we have some other uh, open source projects like LTSI that have, have joined uh, with the project as well. So this is sort of the logo salad of people who are on the advisory board. The way we're governance structured, we're part of the Linux Foundation. We're actually a work group under the Linux Foundation. Uh, we have set up the governance so that it's a, as, a, a, as a, a regular open source project, right? Um, it's all about meritocracy. So there's a, we have the equivalent of Linus Torvalds, and that's uh, Richard Purdy. And so, you know, he has his lieutenants and maintainers and technical leads under that. Um, so that's all like a normal open source project. We do have an advisory board. We ask, we ask if somebody wants to contribute to the project in, in an advisory capacity, uh, providing us feedback and input. We have an advisory board, and it costs some money. It's not an exorbitant amount of money. It's not like it's, it's millions of dollars. It's, uh, I don't remember how much it is, like 10000 or 40000 depending on wh which level of membership you're at. Um, and you can kind of see the, the groups that have, have gone to that level. We also have... Um, <clears throat> established a way that we can build a broader ecosystem through two programs that we call Yocto Project Participant and Yocto Project Compatible. So if you have a software product, for example, like we have tool chains, we have people doing operating systems, we have people doing libraries um, that are Yocto Project compatible, there's a list of things that you fill out on the website and you can use that and, and actually become part of the, the overall community. Um, for participating and saying, hey, I've got some services I want to be able to provide to others. I mean, we have the Octo Project participant, which lets you, again, get you as part of the, that bigger ecosystem. So there's a lot of participants, and there's a lot of probably people who are using the code who will never, will never know. Steve Sackerman said to us one time, uh, you know, there are a lot of people using the code who you will never know who they are, because there's no reason why they have to tell us, right? So... Um, I constantly am hearing about people. The funniest thing is people in my own company, uh, you know, we'd hear about some random piece of email that would bounce from the other side of the planet and say, hey, we hear there's some guys over there and you're part of the company working on the Octo project. Well, duh, yeah. It's like my whole, you know, life these days, you know, and it's like we've got a whole team. And, well, why do you ask? Oh, yeah, we've adopted the Octo project for our random XYZ project. This has been very cool to see. But again, it's, it's typical that I think the sort of thing that's happening all over the place now. Um, you know, so, yeah, in five minutes or less. I love the way Jeffro has given me. I think I hit the 15 minutes on that one. All right, so let me, um, let me pause for a second before I, I talk about these three bits. Is there, are there any questions about anything that I just had? No? Yes? Any questions about the... Uh, what the Octo project is, you see what it is we're trying to do? Okay, all right. Um, let me just zoom in on a few of the things that, that go into the Octo project. As I said, I usually describe it as build system content and uh, developer experience. It's actually more than that because, you know, we also have documentation. 
We also have, you know, BSPs. We also have, uh, you know, QA that gets done. Um, we're putting out a release every six months. We're coming up with our sixth release in April. Um, so we've been bringing those out pretty much like clockwork. We also have, you know, uh, maintenance releases that we bring out for security CVEs primarily, uh, other sort of important patches that are needed. Um, so there's a lot of other stuff, but I generalize it into these sort of three main buckets. Um, so as far as the build system is concerned, um, Bitbake has been an open source uh, uh, build engine uh, available for a number of years. Um, Bitbake is actually a highly efficient, it's basically a Python script with a number of classes that uh, let you, um, you know, customize it for what we're trying to do in the Octo project for building Linux. So you have classes, uh, for example, that, that, that take care of all the things such as fetching sources or um, figuring out metadata and things of that sort. So um, it's highly configurable. It's also, uh, you know, highly uh, um, efficient. Uh, we, when you can build a Linux system on a desktop in 88 minutes, something about Back to the Future? No, 88 minutes is what I, because I just remembered it from our last release criteria meeting. Um, that's pretty good from building everything from sources. Um, so it's highly, it, it really is highly efficient. Um, there are several other utilities that are uh, separate projects uh, as well. Swabber is a tool which will actually can uh, go through and validate uh, that you have no build system um, infection. So that's one of the things that you can actually, you know, double check. It will actually monitor all the opens on the system to make sure when you're doing a build that um, you don't, you know, have a problem there with infection from the build system. Sudo is, you know, how you, the method we use for um, setting, uh, you know, how do you create a root file system uh, while not being root? So you have to create a whole bunch of binaries on your own, you know, uh, set UID zero, right, or uh, user ID zero and things like that owned by root when you're running a build not as root, right? So you don't have to be the root user to run a build. So uh, um, sudo is how we take care of that. Um, uh, Pocky is a, a, essentially a reference um, distribution definition which uh, takes in all of the, the pieces that we have and provides you as uh, you know, a place where we can do QA. So we build Pocky. We actually, when we're releasing the Octo project, it has it actually called Pocky when, when you look at the source um, repository, the Git repository, as well as the releases, it says Pocky. Um, if you're creating your own distribution, you can take the Pocky metadata, which I think is MetaOcto, and then just rename it to something else, right? And then you have the starting point for your own distribution, right? So, but we needed something for which to do our QA around, so that's what Pocky is. We also have, a, I think, a really terrific auto builder infrastructure. It's getting uh, completely refactored and redesigned that there'll be a release um, with our 1.4 release. Beth, Beth assures me, fingers crossed. That will actually be much easier for you and your projects if you want to set up repeatable builds, right? Um, the auto builder is set up that, so that it will actually build all of our targets every night, which is, remember, we've got, you know, four main architectures. Uh, we have five different uh, footprint sizes. We've got um, LSB for the, you know, everything that could go into an LSB system. We have Sato, which is a sort of a graphic, you know, basically it's a GNOME mobile based thing with X. Um, we have Minimal, which is busy box based and headless. We have Tiny, and Tiny is like, I think five megabytes or less or something like that. What's, I missed one. What did I, oh, world, which is, you know, all, all the packages we have. Right, so if you can th kind of think about building across all those architectures, plus a few, so we have 3264-bit on a few of them, all the footprint sizes, all the different variants. We have debug versions as well as non-debug versions. So we're doing all of that stuff every night. It's a lot of build, but the auto builder is basically able to, to handle all of this and um, Beth set it, is setting it up in the new release, so that, and she'll talk more about that, this, I think, in her session. Um, the developer experience is really about um, some of the things beyond just, uh, you know, that, that facilitates not only you as a system developer, but also application developers. So part of the concept of workflow is there's some people who are actually developing the image that will go on the final device, right? So they may be doing some debug, they may be figuring out which packages go in, if I got too much space, what do I need to throw out? Things like that. Then there's another type of developer that's an application developer. Now we typically see different skill sets with that sort of person. A smaller shop, everyone, it's maybe one person that's doing everything, but oftentimes an application developer maybe has some more expertise in making things, you know, um, uh, behave properly in a particular domain, or maybe it's, it's user interaction design, or maybe, you know, more appearance that, that, that's more appropriate. 
it's, things are set up here so that you don't actually need to rebuild Linux if you're an application developer. Because if you're, if you're rebuilding all of Linux, right, it takes um, a reasonably beefy desktop machine to be able to do it, or something, a laptop, right, so your desktop client sort of machine. Maybe you want to not have to have set up all your, your application developers so they all have to do that. So you can have a single person on a project um, do the bit bake, and then you have your application developers that can use the SDK that's created by BitBake. So that's what this application developer toolkit is, is uh, designed to, which is not actually listed here. Oh, well. Uh, we also have a build appliance. This is set up so that you can very easily download um, a, VMware, uh, a VMware guest and has everything built in so that once you download that thing, you can basically boot it straight up into a graphical build experience and be building you know, pretty quickly. Um, without something like this, well, you need to make sure you have a particular version of Linux or certain packages installed. To try and short circuit that as, as quickly as possible, um, we created this build appliance. Now, <coughs> this thing is also a concept we're extending on because there's some things that you can actually um, use this thing in more of a headless manner to be able to, for example, uh, use Eclipse on a non-Linux operating system. Um, one of the things I think is kind of interesting, I had somebody just uh, yesterday, maybe that guy looking at me right now and smiling at me, who said, boy, I'd love to be able to, to do a build on my Mac OS, right? And so using Eclipse within the Mac, um, conceptually, we're going to be um, allowing you to use this thing so that the build part of it can actually go on in this image. And this could be running in VMware or it could be just running on another machine in your lab somewhere that's just dedicated for build. So we're kind of extending this concept as part of the developer experience. We've got Eclipse tools. You can either use this with a, do your app or system development with Eclipse or not as you choose. Um, and as I said, we're extending this so you can run it on Mac or Windows or any other OS that Eclipse will run on. Um, Hob is a graphical user experience for BitBake. So it lets you, you know, so you don't have to go in and figure out where all, what, are all, what a bunch of config files um, are doing how to edit them. So kind of simplifies that process. And we're coming up with a web version of this as well. Um, we're working with a design agency that's helping us out with this. And we, uh, it's, it's all open source. And it's really kind of a community development effort. So if you want to join the mailing list that's talking about this, this would give a, a great way to participate. I'm actually going to show a screenshot tomorrow morning. I'm doing a little keynote uh, tomorrow on the Embedded Linux conference. I'm actually going to show you a screenshot that got people incredibly excited, people who are typically uh, let's call them uh, gooey skeptical, uh, looked at it and they said, wow, if, if we had something like this, I would use it. You know, so, okay, so we'll show you a little bit about what that's about tomorrow. Uh, but we're you know, continuing to develop that. So there's a lot in terms of the developer experience. And I think the other part that, that doesn't quite go into this, if you think about it, is that you know, if you have a desktop Linux build situation, you can actually develop code that might go on your device Maybe it's you know, not something you want to share out with the world. You want to keep it kind of close to the vest. You can do it on your desktop, and you don't have to set up an elaborate server infrastructure. So that's part of the developer experience. It can be very small. Or you can you know, scale it up to a, a large sort of situation with some of these things like the auto builder and the build appliance and some things like that. Okay, so it's, it's a pretty scalable sort of environment. Um, and then content, uh, <clears throat> in this case, uh, the metadata that comes with, um, that we provide with the system is really a lot of what we call recipe files. These recipe files end with .bb. What the idea behind here is that they list, at the most minimal level, they list, they, it shows what's the URL for the sources for, for a given you know, package, um, what's the source license, checksums for the, for the source and the, the license, and then uh, overrides for things like uh, for every step in the process. So for, this, for each of these things, we'll do a source fetch, patching, compiling, packaging, uh, installing, and packaging, right? So for each of those steps, you can override them, append to them, prepend to them, et cetera, right? So that's essentially uh, add additional files. Per, per, like, for example, in the install step, maybe there's a, a specific files you want to install in the target. You can append that to the install step, right? So each of these steps is really designed for maximal sort of configurability and adjustability. Um, and uh, um, you know, so like I said, we've, we've designed this to, to make it so that you can construct um, you know, a, a, a working system, right? Building a working Linux system. You know, this is where the, the, the difficult part comes in that we've hopefully done 
you know, the hard part, which is figuring out the versions that work together, created the patches that work together, and uh, you know, this is the thing that we're QAing you know, regularly and that we're releasing every six months. And all of them really are configurable um, in layers, and so that you really can override any of the metadata that we provided in a layer, and so you can say within that layer, I want to you know, disable these things or enable these other things, and so uh, we have a number of example layers that um, I think are, are showing how this, this concept works. All of this is part, uh, a, a, a bunch of this, a large part of this, this content is actually part of a con uh, open source project called Open Embedded Core. So this is the core metadata for the open embedded project. So we work you know, with the rest of the community to really make sure that that core metadata is really solid. Um, and then there's other content. Uh, EGLibc is part of the Octo project. That's part of the umbrella. Uh, Matchbox is another uh, example. There are a number of these sort of um, small open source projects that are part of it. Well, we also have a number of starting points that we've, we've established, developed so that you don't have to start with those five um, you know, footprint sizes I talked about, those five starting points. We actually build on those to things like uh, Baryon, which is an, a starter kit for network attached storage. Right? So if you want to do na a NAS, start with Baryon. That's a layer. Right on top of you know probably minimal I'm guessing because it's headless um, has web-based uh, administration has all of those things built in you add a BSP layer away you go uh, web kiosk is a, a HTML5 um, delivery mechanism but it's basically a starting point for a web kiosk uh, but it's but the compatibility is all the way up through uh, HTML5 as well um, the multimedia uh, starting point this is how to Create things like a DLNA, DNLA, D DLNA. Did I? Which one? Okay, DLNA. Anyway, multimedia. Um, uh, virtualization, the meta virtualization layer. There's actually a talk about meta virtualization um, this uh, week at ELC. Um, this gives you a starting point for creating things like a KVM guest, a Zen guest, etc. Um, there's an automotive layer that's being uh, maintained by Wind River, I think. Is that right? I think that's right, yes. Uh, there's a robotics layer. There's a number of these that are, that are um, both there now and coming soon, so you get a really clear starting point of, of a place to start so you don't have to invent a bunch of stuff, right? But if you come up with something else that's, that's you know, we'd encourage you to do so and share it with the community. I mean, this, is, this is, makes it a you know, powerful uh, thing when we're working together as a community. Okay, that was five minutes on that. Uh, <clears throat> I could easily take an hour just talking about this. this. This is a work of art, I think. But anyway. But basically what this, this shows is the workflow for the project, uh, for, for BitBake. The, the blue box is really BitBake. Um, it's really, the, 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 the inputs here are, you know, user configuration. You know, things like I want to configure, you know, which layers I'm going to use or how many processors I'm going to use on this build, right? Um, the metadata that I talked about, um, each of those recipes, plus the patches. Um, then you have like a BSP configuration that would go in, and then uh, other policy configuration that we want. Well, uh, you know, the default you want to use for your distribution. Then you, you type bitbake and a target, and then it will go through and it will pull. The first thing it does is source fetching. Bitbake actually understands um, all the popular uh, um, you know, source code management systems, and a bunch that are not particularly popular either, but, you know, that are still supported. Um, uh, or, you know, you can pull it from just a source mirror, right? So if you can, if you're, if you're working in with a group, you want to make sure, make sure everybody uses just that version of the sources rather than pulling them down from the internet, you can set up your own local project for that, right? So you fetch the sources, pat, apply the patches. Uh, if it's an autoconf project, it'll do autoconf. Um, otherwise, it's doing the uh, compile and uh, you know uh, installing uh, piece. There's some output analysis for doing packaging, and then I always thought it was kind of funny. Every Linux project has its religion about which packaging you use. Is it Deb or is it uh, RPM or whatever? Um, one of the things I love about this is that we don't we don't care. Use either one. We support them both. Plus another one called IPK, which is a more simplified uh, sort of embedded style packaging mechanism. So. You can pick either one that you want. Those get populated into a package feed, and then out of the package feed, you can it, the, the image is generated, so you get bootable images. And then uh, this SDK 
is really a, uh, you know, cross tools and a sysroot so that you can then do application development. Okay, so that's, you know, application development outside of, so you don't have to rebuild Linux. Okay? All right. I think that's my last slide. Yes. Uh, I probably did that faster than I was expecting to. I was hoping my voice wouldn't give out. All right, so what questions do you guys have about this? Yes, please. So uh, I saw TI was on the board for this, but uh, for a lot of their processors, they run something called the Arago project, which um, seems uh, to use the open embedded tools, but isn't part of, it doesn't have all the Yocto tools in here. What's the, do you, can you talk to the difference, even though you don't work for TI? I see someone from TI with his hand up. He can probably say, why don't you speak to the microphone there, Bill? Come on. Thanks. Bill Mills, member of the advisory board for the Yocto project. Yeah, so um, we started the Arago project before Yocto project um, started. Uh, the original versions used uh, Open Embedded Classic, um, and that's still out there. Some customers are still using that, um, and we have to keep that going. Um, but the new releases, um, the, the Satara SDK releases in last fall and the one coming up for this quarter, they do a release every quarter. Those are now rebased on top of the Yocto baseline. Um, so, and <coughs> you, you can see this if you go to the Yocto project. There's a Meta TI layer, which is all the TI support. Um, and then there's a Meta Arago, which is, adds the, the specific mix-ins that, uh, that, that they add for the uh, AM SDK. So uh, we, we have Meta TI. On the Arago project, uh, we also mirror it up to the Yocto project's Git server. Um, so you can go to Yocto project and take Pocky and Meta TI, and that combination should work. Um, or you could build it just the way TI builds it for their SDKs using Meta TI and Meta Arago. So the idea is that it, we, we give you the choice of whichever way you want to do it. Um, definitely, well, I mean, you definitely start with the Meta TI. I would start with Meta Arago, see what it does, and then uh, I, I would just try them both out and see which works better for you. If, if your use case is more aligned to what the AM SDK is doing, you may find some starters in the, in the Meta Arago that may be useful to you, but it, it's, it's optional, right? The hardware support is in Meta TI. Thanks, Bill. What is it, why, why do you use the name Arago? I'll have to ask you. I'll buy you a beer and find out what the story is. All right, other questions? Yeah. Uh, it's similar, a little different. Um, to get a package from Freescale, they add on top of the actual project mm -hmm. uh, right now 1.2. Yes. So uh, have you talked about these type of case with um, uh, the standard? How is it going to Yeah. Yeah, the, the beautiful thing here, by the way, is if we can get everybody to, to sort of use the same sort of approach to embedded Linux, it really makes the, the whole ecosystem much, work much more, you know, kind of efficiently so people don't have to, you know, do a bunch of porting work or whatever. Uh, Freescale, uh, we've been working and, and very uh, grateful to Matthew uh, McClintock, did I get the name right? Yeah, who's uh, with uh, Freescale, and he's been uh, maintaining that, uh, that work. And so um, it'd be great... Uh, uh, I think the Linux Foundation do talk to them periodically about joining the advisory board. So uh, I think they just joined Linux Foundation recently. Yeah, I think that was the last I'd heard. So you know, hopefully uh, at some point they'll do that. But yeah, that's kind of the idea of uh, chip vendors. You know, basically supporting this general direction, I, supporting the Octo project, producing BSPs so they don't have to produce a separate sort of silicon Linux. Other questions? Right. Right, they're doing it for both PowerPC and their ARM parts, so, uh, right. They're maintaining their public key. They're maintaining their uh, SDKs. SDKs. Okay. Meta, meta, meta Metadata. Data. Okay, Meta Freescale, right, yeah. Okay, other questions? Yes, please. <coughs> yeah.
Right. Yeah. And, yeah. So the the the. Yeah. The. Yeah. Yeah. So so let me give you kind of a so the model is it sounded I, I thought I heard I thought I understood your question then you added another piece which I thought was interesting um, so the so let me see if I can I can answer it I'll probably do a bad job the general idea is that doing bit bake requires a reasonably sized system. Um, and also, do you really want to have ever, all the application developers rebuilding Linux? Well, you can't. No, yeah. So um, things are really set up so with that SDK, you have all the cross tools. So the cross GCC and cross libraries and all the rest of that are all set up, cross debuggers, et cetera, plus a sysroot for your target device. So that's how that thing is set up so that typically you could create your application. What you're, I think, talking about is now I want to reincorporate that application back into the image that's being created. Um, that is, that's, really, uh, uh, that's really a good question. Do, we don't have any automation specifically for that, do we? Yeah. So that, that's a part of the workflow that would need to get filled in by how you want to manage it. Is it? Okay, yeah. <coughs> yeah, well, yeah, because it, it, it's a little daunting sometimes. Yeah. 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 What 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 he said was one of the. This is one of the part of what we'd like to do with the Web Hub project is work on more of these uh, workflow things. And so we'd love to get your input. I'd love to talk to you maybe and see if I can get more. I think I understand what it is you're saying, and I. It's something in my mind that's been sort of missing as well. Now there are other more. Um, you know, commercial products, for example, that do have tool suites. Hey guys, there's seats up here if you want to. Come on down. Why don't you come on down? We'd love to have you down here so you don't have to stand in the back. I know it's more fun to be. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. I'm going to ask you to give, my, give the first part of the talk now. Uh, so yeah, in answer, yeah, I would really like to talk to you more to see what we can do to, you know, again, philosophically, we've tried not to be too, um, you know, rigid in terms of how we define the workflow, but that's probably an example of something we could we could do a few more things in. Yeah. So how would they do that? That would probably be with that. Uh, that you know, for sure, joining the Yocto project mailing list would be really good. There's. Well, there is a web hub mailing list. Yeah, and there is a web hub mailing list. So so that's a you know another place probably good to join. She's actively looking for people to talk to. Excellent. Yeah. I, so we have a designer who's working on the team. Actually, one of those user interface experts who is actually looking for help um, uh, from people who can give her, you know, feedback on that stuff. So that'd be really good. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, the way to think of it. One of the things that's really powerful about this is that. Um, because we create a package feed and then create the images from the package feed, we actually have the, the uh, packaging, the package um, um, tools available. If you're using RPM, uh, we were using Zipper and now we're using uh, Smart, is what we're moving to, the Smart Updater. Use just the, the dev tools basically for dev packaging. So yeah, that's actually pretty powerful from that sort of development standpoint. If I'm doing development here, I don't have a package there, I can have it Populate it in my repository and then just populate it from and just install it from there. But is, it a, is that a viable way to add content post facto? Once the system's been installed? No, to add it to the image once you're looking at the bit page. Yes. So why you have the image and yeah. the file that's on the Oh, you're saying opening that thing up like mounting on a file system, then sticking another file in and then unmounting it, that sort of thing. Did I just ask and answer my question? Doesn't work that way in the moment. Well, so yeah, uh, uh, let's talk more about what you were thinking about. I mean, generally speaking, the development plan, is, the development model is that you would install that image on a device and use the package management tools to update the packages while you're doing development. Um, if you just had the image sitting there and you wanted to jam a, a package into that image, I think you just have to pretty much you could just mount it, couldn't? Can't you? You could just mount the file system and then just add it. So that's fairly simple. 
or just rebuild the image, yeah. Because that's, that's pretty much the last step of, of what happens at BitBig. OK, other questions? Uh, I think, Tracy, you wanted to just have the talk, I mean, to see if I can put the website up, right? No. Go for it. Uh, you want a mic? Is this right? Sure. Can you hear me? Does that help? Yeah. Should I talk even louder so that you wake up? Everyone's awake, actually. Um, so my name's Tracy Irway. I actually work for Intel, but I am also on the advocacy subgroup of the Octo Project. And because I didn't pay attention to anything that Dave said, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> I know he must have talked about the governance model, and I know he talked about the compliance program and whatnot. But um, really, to me, when I look at this project, um, and being from an, when I say advocacy, I'm talking about marketing and. Uh, so I want to talk to you about marketing the project before we go any further because this is a room full of people who are in, a, in an advanced training session and so I know the project's actually getting used somewhere. Um, I started off in embedded systems development and I went to marketing because you got to dress better basically and that was important to me. So I take it very seriously. I'm just kidding. You guys have no sense of humor. Um, <laughs> I take it very seriously, and, I'm, and when I talk about marketing the Octo Project, I'm not talking to, you know, you don't have to cry at the Hallmark commercials or whatever. It's not that serious. But uh, the, the more people that know about the Octo Project and know what you're doing with it, the more people are, are going to be interested in using it because uh, it, it's, it's seeming to be very worthwhile, and more and more people are starting to come to the training sessions and ask questions and be on the email list and whatever. So we actually, I don't know if you guys have seen the booth yet. We, um, we have this temporary booth that anyone who's at a conference and wants to represent the Octo Project, you can grab the booth and take it with you and do that. It doesn't matter who you work for or what you do if you're talking about the Octo Project um, and contributing to the Octo Project and serious about it. You can use the assets from the project itself. We have a new website that we managed to put together. And if you look at the website, one of the first things that, it's, uh, that it does differently now than it used to do is it has this section called the ecosystem. And uh, if you look in the navigation, and the ecosystem is supposed to be about what you guys do. Um, it's your projects, like Mr. Ridge Run. We would want to talk about you on the Octa Project website. Seriously, Todd. And all you guys, I don't even know where you work. Let's see. Oh, that's right. You're from the University of Costa Rica, and we're trying to figure out how we can do some educational stuff with Costa Rica. Um, access communication. Do we have anything on our website about you? Not yet. Not yet. Good answer. <laughs> See? That's what you're supposed to say, not yet. And then you look at my badge, you say, not yet, Tracy. We can't wait to contact you and talk to you about this. And I'm serious, um, because it it means a lot more to the entire industry to know that people who work for really well-run, interesting, cool product kinds of companies are interested in the Octo Project. It doesn't matter what processor. It doesn't matter what you know, commercial operating system you might be using. It doesn't matter what kind of systems at all, or it doesn't even matter what your product is. You don't even have to have a product. You can just have a POC. You can be doing R&D. It would be really cool to hear about it in some way, shape, or form. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, at the very least right now, being part of the, compatibility, the compliance program, having a product that's compatible or being a participant is uh, at least a first step or one step. But we're going to start coming up with other mechanisms so that you can tell us about what it is that you're doing, if you want to. What, Dave? Oh, my screensaver kicked out. Oh, God. Not that one. Sorry. That's really all I have to say. That was sort of... <laughs> Timing is that's about as much marketing as anyone can handle at ELC. So I'm done, Dave. Your turn again. Oh, okay. 
This is uh, when I expect a lot of applause because, you know, maybe I've <laughs>